All right, another day, another dollar. And uh, today we'll be talking about Raft. Um, so if you don't know what Raft is, it's a consensus algorithm that came out in 2014, more or less, and it's been really popular, actually, getting a ton of usage, even compared to, uh, you know, like older ones like Paxos. And the reason for that is that it is pretty easy to understand, and it was made so that it was easy to understand. And so I guess if my dumb ass at 21 can understand it, then I will be proving to the writers of the paper that they're doing a good job. So let's get into it and see if your dumb asses can also understand it. Okay, Raft, what is it? Well, Raft is really just a consensus algorithm that has some level of fault tolerance. What this means is that we can use it to build a replicated log. So basically every single um, position in the log is a decision that is made by the Raft algorithm. And as such, we can use this to create total order broadcast. Eventually, every single node will have the same exact log, which means that we have this um, idea of eventual consistency. And um, you know, if, you're, if you've ever heard of something like Paxos or actually multi-Paxos to create a fully replicated log, which is kind of just meaning that you're doing Paxos, but for multiple stages, so every single entry of the log, um, there are a lot of similarities there, but they're not identical. So in terms of how it's actually used, as you can see, imagine we have these three database replicas at the bottom of the screen here, and every single replica has a log associated with it. Imagine that's like the right ahead log. And this log is going to be running in a raft instance on the database, and all it's going to have is the operation on the log and then something called a term number, which I'll explain later. As you can see, they're not all completely identical, but eventually they will be. Okay. So before we get into this, I'm just going to do a quick review term because, you know, if you haven't watched all of these videos, then some of these might not make sense to you and I'll be using them throughout. So first of all, what's a quorum? A quorum is a majority of nodes in any cluster of nodes. In this case, it's a majority of nodes in a database cluster of replicas. And so basically the point of using a quorum is that if two different quorums of nodes have made some decision, as in all of the nodes in that quorum agree on something, they cannot make conflicting decisions because that means that one of those nodes must overlap within the two quorums, and so it's impossible to have a conflicting decision because one node can't decide two different things about, say, the same entry of a log. Um, additionally, we discussed something called a fencing token in a previous video, which is basically just what the term number is in Raft. It's an increasing number used in situations like split brain, where there might be multiple leaders, or even with a locking system, to basically go ahead and say, um, you know, take the higher number, that one wins. And so if there's ever a conflict about, you know, two nodes believing that they have this one resource, whether that's being the leader holding a lock, the higher fencing number wins. And then finally, we have this concept of a leader. In Raft, the leader takes all of the writes and even some of the reads if you want um, strong consistency, but there are other ways to get strong consistency on reads by doing things like quorum reads. And a leader is going to go ahead and um, take in all the writes and propagate those to the other nodes, which are known as followers. So let's quickly go over the way that Raft works on like a very high level, and then I'll dive into how each of these pieces actually works. So basically, like I mentioned, there's one leader at at least at a time, there's one leader per term where each term is identified by a number. And the leader is going to send all of the rights for that term to the follower nodes. Once a leader receives responses from a quorum of the nodes, so that would be a majority, it can go ahead and tell them to commit those rights to the above database layer. Once they're committed, the above database layer is going to put them in their key value store. And then finally, reads can actually go ahead and read that key and value. And then finally, the biggest thing here is that one of the things I've mentioned in my past videos for mainly single, re single leader replication is that if a leader is presumed dead, you kind of just have to do a failover, but um, that's not always an easy process to do and it's not always automatic. But in this case, if a leader is presumed dead, um, a follower node is actually going to potentially go ahead and try and become the new leader. And once that happens, um, there is consensus reached amongst the follower nodes about who the new leader is, and we don't have to worry about split brain. Raft actually goes ahead and solves that for us. Okay. So let's talk about leader election first, because this is kind of the big reason why Raft works, which is that there is only one leader, and there can only be one leader at a time per term. Okay. So basically, in Raft, every node is either a leader, a candidate, or a follower. So let's start by talking about the followers. Each follower node, these are nodes that are going to be accepting rights, periodically receives heartbeats from the leader to basically say, hi, I'm still up and running, don't try and replace me. 
However, if a follower node doesn't receive a heartbeat within, within some amount of timeout, where um, this timeout is typically the length of a few heartbeats um, up to you know, the amount of time that it might take for a new election process to ensue, it will assume the leader to be dead and declare itself to be the state of candidate. Once a node calls itself a candidate, it's going to start a new election process, vote for itself, and tell all the other nodes that it's starting said election process. It's also going to increase its internal term number, which I'll maybe call a local term number later, by one. So it's saying this is a new term, we're going to have a new leader, or maybe the same leader as before, but it's going to be under a new term number. Next, in addition, because this um, follower node, who's now a candidate node, is going to have to have a majority of votes to become a leader, we don't want every single follower starting new elections at the same time. Because if they do, they're all going to vote for themselves and then no node is actually going to be elected a leader. So what we do is we randomize the timeouts that each follower node has on it locally to determine when a leader is dead. And what this does is it means that a follower node will typically, you know, one might go off and say, oh, I think the leader is dead, and the others will still think the leader is alive, but know that a vote is going on. So that heartbeat timer is going to be randomized uniformly over some distribution, where the distribution is the length, probably at minimum, of a few heartbeats, but also still enough to make sure that an entire election process can ensue without some other node saying, wait, I think I'm the candidate, and now I want to try myself. Okay. So let's keep talking about leader election, because now we have to talk about what happens when a follower node receives word that a new node is the candidate. Well, there are a few things that we have to check. Firstly, if the candidate term number is higher than the local term number, um, the, the local, basically the, the follower node that is going to receive the fact that there's an election needs to become a follower, and that's the case even if that node was a leader, and then additionally change their local term number to the candidate term number. Now we're saying, okay, we're moving on to a new term. Everyone has to update this fact. Additionally, we're going to go ahead and say, if the candidate log is more up to date than the local log, and you know, I'll talk about how you can kind of determine if a log is more up to date than another, because there might even be conflicts there. But if the candidate log is more up to date than the local log, and the node, aka the, the local node, hasn't voted for any other candidate this term, and it knows if it has because it's kind of keeping track of what term it is and what nodes it's voted for in a given term, the node will reply saying that, okay, you have my vote. If those conditions aren't met, so either the candidate log is not enough up to date or the node's already voted for someone else this term, it does not vote for the candidate and it responds to the candidate saying, I'm not voting for you. So once the candidate receives all these responses, it tallies them up and basically it says, okay, if I reach two thirds, or not two thirds, but rather a majority of nodes in the cluster, if I get a response saying that they've voted for me, I'll declare myself the leader. Otherwise, we have this concept of an election timeout, and if it doesn't hear back from all the other nodes, eventually it's gonna say, okay, I give up on this election. Okay, broadcasting messages. So we now discussed how we have our leader. How's the leader actually going to pass these rights to the following nodes? Well, the leader is going to receive a message to broadcast, so it might either receive that from the client itself, or the client um, gives it to one of the other nodes, and the other nodes passes it to the leader via a FIFO channel, so we make sure all those messages are coming in the same order. And then it's going to go ahead and add it to its local log, but also make sure not to commit it. What that means is that even though the message is in the log, the database part can't actually see the message and won't make the change. And it's going to go ahead and send it to all the other nodes, um, via a function, which for now I'm just going to call replicate log. And then additionally, replicate log is going to be called periodically, so that kind of acts as the heartbeat that a leader sends to follower nodes in the event that another election needs to happen. And then finally, it also helps that replicate log is periodically called, so the leader can alert the other nodes if there are any new messages to actually commit, which means, you know, tell the database, hey, this is a valid write. Okay. So let's talk about this replicate log function because this is pretty important because this is kind of like why Raft works. So for each node, what's going to happen is this. The leader has its um, local copy of the log. And for that local copy, the leader is now keeping track of every single follower and how many messages that it's sent to the follower and how many messages that the follower has acknowledged that they've received from the leader. And using this, it can try and determine which messages the follower has on hand which it'll call a prefix, and then all of the new messages that the leader contains, but they assume the follower doesn't contain, is called the suffix. So what it's going to do is send all of the messages from the suffix, so new messages that they assume the follower doesn't yet have, to that follower, 
And in addition, it's going to send the term number of the last entry of the prefix. So I'm going to explain why it does that in a second. Um, another thing to note is that the leader is not always right about what the prefix and the suffix are for each node. It might be the case that um, a certain follower node has less of the correct messages in its log than the leader originally thought. And if that's the case, it's going to have to go back and uh, make further changes. So I'll explain that in a bit. But right now, all that's important is we're going ahead and sending those suffix messages to be appended on the follower. And we're also sending the term number of the last entry of the prefix. Why are we sending that term number of the last entry of the prefix? Well, because there is an invariant about every single replicated log in Raft, which basically says this. If the logs on two replicas have the same term number at the same index in the log, they must be the same up to and including that index. So looking here at these two database replicas, as you can see in index 2, assuming this is a zero index log, we have the entry C for the operation, so like write C, and then the term number is 4. We know that if these guys have the same term number, it means that the leader has written to both of them. And as a result of that, anything beforehand must have been uh, correct so that the leader could have written to them in the first place. Um, something like this situation is not possible right here, where you know they both have C4 in that 2 entry, but then you know they differ in the 0th entry with A3 and D2. Um, if you think about this invariant a little bit more, it's you know kind of a lot to think about, but it eventually becomes clear why it works. Um, you know, if you want to pause this video and read my, read my note here, you definitely can. Uh, but the general point is, we know that um, the leader is right, and that's the reason it was elected in the first place. So, if the follower has a different prefix at a point, the leader needs to go ahead and overwrite that prefix and um, not just make new appends to the log. It's got to go ahead and change its logic. Okay, sorry, my roommate came in mid-recording. So basically, continuing to talk about the replicate log function. Um, because of the invariant just previously mentioned, we basically know that if the term number at the end of the prefixes are the same, we can just go ahead and copy over that suffix and um, put in those correct messages, and then the, the log of the follower will be the same as the log of the leader. Um, if the prefixes are not the same, then we know that um, the assumption that the leader made about what the follower already has in its log is bad, and we're going to have to go ahead and report that back to the leader. Additionally, um, when the leader commits the suffixes to the followers, which it only does if the prefixes are correct, then we'll go ahead and have the follower check for newly committed uh, messages so that it can uh, commit those to the database layer. Okay, in terms of receiving write acknowledgments on the leader, um, as we just mentioned, the reader wants a quorum of write acknowledgments. So if it receives a majority of uh, you know, acknowledgments for a successful write for a given log entry, it's going to go ahead and keep track of these. And once it reaches that quorum, it goes ahead, commits it locally, and then sends that commit out to all of the followers. Um, additionally, if it hears that a write wasn't successful, it must be because the prefix of the leader and the follower node were not the same, or because of the fact that they had a different term number between them. And if the term number of the follower is higher than the leader, the leader now knows that um, it's no longer the leader and has to give up its leader status and transition to follower. If it's because the prefix of the follower was not up to date enough, then what the leader is going to try and do is try to replicate the log again, but with a smaller prefix and see if it works this time. And that might potentially be a loop that spans very far, where you just keep adjusting the prefix to be smaller and smaller, assuming that the follower knows less and less, until you finally reach the amount of the log that they have in common, and then you can go ahead and replicate what you have. Okay, so in conclusion, um, even though the Raft paper is from 2014, like I mentioned, it's gained a ton of popularity because it's ease of understandability. And I just explained it to you guys in basically 15 minutes, so clearly it's not that bad, um, and it's hugely popular. Uh, it still takes a ton of network coordination in order to do all this stuff. You basically have to reach out to every node, or at least attempt to do so, and get acknowledgments from a majority of them. Um, compared to two-phase commit, though, the fact that it's so fault-tolerant is really great. That being said, there's still times where two-phase commit is more useful than Raft, and the main example of that are things like atomic commit across partitions. Obviously, in Raft, if we want to make writes to multiple partitions, it's not enough for only a majority of them to say, okay, yeah, I got this. All of them have to acknowledge it. And then maybe within the partitions, um, you know, obviously we replicate each partition, you can use something like Raft. 
Um, nonetheless, it's really important to understand this algorithm as it gives a great idea of um, kind of a lot of the concepts that we've talked about, such as quorums, fencing tokens, and even just like two-phase commit in general, how there's kind of this idea of a prepare phase and then eventually committing that right to the database layer. Ultimately, it's really important to know about Raft, and not necessarily every step of it, but generally what you might use it for, and additionally, in subsequent videos, how it differs from other consensus algorithms like Paxos or Zap, and I'll get to those eventually too. Well, either way, guys, this is probably the most theoretical video I've had so far, but I hope it was easy enough to understand, and have a great day.